Um, so that was, yeah, that's the Palace team. We've got Bert Head as the manager. And we are going to go on to the fact that later that season, you say, we got promoted. But looking at the Charlton side, when you're there as a youngster again, you're probably not taking in the opposition. But I think there's one player, and it does actually link with something you said just earlier, there's one player who, when I looked through the team sheet, I didn't really recognise too many of them. But there was Keith... Keith Peacock. Peacock. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that because that's the one name I can remember. Yeah. Keith Peacock, yeah. Uh, I, who else was in that team? Because that was the one name I can remember. Charlie Wright, Robert Curtis, Brian Kinsey, Alan Campbell, Paul Went, Peter Reeves, Harry Gregory, Dennis Booth, Matt Tease, Graham Moore. I, I literally... Yeah. I, no, it's it's Keith Peacock. He's the one that yeah. I, the only one I remember. So Keith Peacock, do you know why he's famous? Do you know what his claim to fame is? Uh, did he I, did he go to Leicester? I don't know. He, I, no, I don't. But, I, we, but but how bizarre that we remember his, his name because he must have done more than anyone else in that team. Yeah. Well, he was the first ever substitute in British football. Wow. Wow. 1965, he replaced the goalkeeper, actually. So they just brought it in. It was August... And it was against Bolton. Apparently their goalkeeper got injured and yeah. he had to come on after 11 minutes. And that's yeah. that's why he's famous. Wow. What are um, the clubs I'm curious. Keith Peacock. He, I think he, he spent a long time at Charlton. I think he was possibly their record appearance maker. But, yeah, and no, he, that, he that came makes... back as a coach a couple of times. And of course, this is the link. His son, Gavin, who played for Chelsea, um, he... Became a minister as well. Became a religious oh, minister. Wow. Yeah. So there are connections across. You know, the Lord. The Lord is looking over us. Um, I know. I just I tell you. I just. I've just looked this up. He played for Charlton. He played five hundred and thirty-two games for Charlton. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And that's the only club he played for in England. He then went to Columbus Magic yeah, yeah. and the Tampa Bay Rowdies. That's uh, and he only played a couple of games for Tampa Bay Rowdies indoor football. Mm. Uh, and then he managed Gillingham, Bay, Maidstone, and Charlton caretaker, and Tampa Bay Rowdies. Tampa Bay Rowdies is where I actually. That's why he became he became an assistant manager at Tampa Bay Rowdies. That's why his name popped up again. Yeah. Right, he, he's still around. He's only in his seventies, mid, mid to late seventies. Yeah. Um, so, as I say, we the league positions were interesting actually because we, we were playing them in the FA Cup John and then we were vying with them basically to get promoted you say Derby sort of ran away with it a little bit although we beat them at the baseball ground as it was then um, but then um, we managed to get into that second spot and as you say beat Fulham having been 2-0 down and you know Charlton ended up third and didn't go up so you know there's there's quite a, a nice sort of um continuity there yeah and when you look at the first division then um Leeds won it Man yep. City won the FA Cup and Newcastle actually won the Fairs Cup so that sort of gives you the context of where we were in 1969 um going forward so you started going to Palace pretty regularly and that that first division, you know, the first time in the top flight was something where you went, you know, pretty much every every home match. And and then... The game I was able to go to, I went to, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what about your first... You said you went away as well. Can you remember what your first away match was? Um, a league, league match, you mean? Yeah. Because obviously Charlton was the first away game. Um, uh, I think... Um, well, I know that uh, London clubs I would have gone to. I, I think the first time I went on a coach to Sheffield United. Wow. And uh, and so, uh, and I, that was in when things were starting to get pretty ugly. And I think someone got stabbed uh, before we got back on the coach. Um, but a friend and I went up sort of at the last minute on the coach to... Uh, up to Sheffield United where we lost 1-0. I have a horrible history of going to away games where we lose one nil. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that that was I think the first kind of long longer distance one that I did. Uh, Millwall a number of times. Um, 
you know, and, and uh, Fulham away. And, it, you know, all the London clubs, it was easy. Watford, uh, I'm pretty sure I went to. Um, but I think I, my memory is the first kind of longer trip was was probably Sheffield United on the coach. Mm -hmm. um, so going back now into, you know, you, you left for the States in, you know, the early 80s. So suddenly getting to Selhurst Park wasn't um, a bus ride on the 403 or whatever. It was, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away. So originally, as you say, you were listening, you know, to the World Service and getting the results, but then things changed. So I'm, I'm interested how now you consume football, because clearly in America, English football is very popular all of a sudden. So when you're in LA, wherever you might be in the States, you obviously need to um, get up pretty early to watch a game. If, so if it's a 12.30 kickoff, you know, you're going to have to get up in the middle of the night, basically, to watch a game. Can you remember the first game that you actually watched on television in America? Because, as I say, I assume when you first went, there wasn't any televised coverage, but now... It's no, 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 there was none at all. Um, there, there was, you could watch certain things on the internet once that came in. But before yeah. that, I remember in the first house I brought in, in Los Angeles in Studio City, I put in one of those old 10 foot satellite dishes, one of those massive dishes that I put that in the back on the hill behind my house and I could get one game a week and it was free. You know, I didn't have to pay. It was just, uh, uh, and then Satanta kind of came in and then you could subscribe. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was basically one game a week. And then it sort of all blew open when Fox, first of all, and then NBC bought the rights and um, and then once NBC got involved, it was extraordinary because you can watch every single Premier League game in America, uh, every game of every team. So um, it changed radically, and that was probably ten, at least ten years ago. Uh, and uh, it wasn't particularly expensive to subscribe, and still isn't particularly expensive. Um, so now I. I my ritual is, to be honest with you, you say if it's a 12.30 kickoff, you have to get up at 4.30 in the morning. I'll be honest with you, I don't. No. I take those. I, I, I don't watch them. Um, I need my sleep, and I've always needed my sleep. So if it's a 6 o'clock kickoff, which is sometimes is on Sunday, which is at 2 p.m., I'll, yeah. I'll generally make that unless I am you know had a really late night, in which case I'll usually be there for the second half. Um, 7 o'clock I'll make, but the 3 o'clock kickoff's, uh, is always good and anything after that. And then the, the evening games are, are, are either 11.45 a.m. or noon um, in yeah. L.A., so I'll watch those. Um, but, yeah, my ritual at a weekend, you know, is uh, unless I've got stuff going on, um, it used to be uh, I would watch, I'll watch three games. You know, I'll watch three games on a, on a Saturday usually uh, and then two on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, and actually, they've got a thing now called Goal Rush on NBC, which is fantastic. So if Palace aren't playing, you watch one game, but they'll cut to every game as every goal goes in. So you don't have to kind of go for the highlights afterwards. You can actually see across the board, which I, I think is fantastic. And I, I, I watched, um, you can watch six games. You can see the goals from six different games at a time, yeah. uh, which is great. Um, but so, yeah, now I... I very, very rarely miss a Palace game. Right. And I think the NBC coverage, I'm, I believe, is enhanced by the fact that is Rebecca Lowe still one of the main... Yeah, players? Rebecca's been hosting it now for, God, at least five years, maybe more. Um, she's obviously a Palace fan and she's terrific and she's brilliant at her job. And I and I like Robbie, the two Robbies, Robbie Earl and, and Robbie Musto. Um, they got a good team. they got a good team, actually. They're, they're very very, very good at what they do and they're very well respected. They sometimes yeah. have people filling in for them and they're also usually pretty good. Um, Danny Higginbottom is very, very good. Um, I've actually inter been interviewed by him when my book came out and, and I thought he was terrific. He's a smart guy, really, really lovely guy and a, and a very knowledgeable football man. Absolutely. 
and I've forgiven him because he once scored a, get a goal for Southampton, which actually ended up relegating us. But yeah, yeah I've chatted to him. He, he is a lovely he guy. Reminded me of that. Did he? Yeah. He's not that lovely a guy, is he? If, he, if he's going to do that sort of stuff. No, it was, it was um, all in good humour. Because, yeah, as you say, 10 years ago would have been roughly the time that Palace returned to the Premier League. So we played Tottenham on our first game back in 2013. Did, I assume you watched that one. It was, I think it was probably an afternoon game here. So I'd assume you, you caught that one, did you? Can you remember it? Yeah, yeah. I flew back for the, the playoff final um, against uh, against Watford. Um Again, one of the great, great days of my life. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited to the the players' party afterwards, and that was quite something. Um, quite something. Uh, yeah. So that was that was a great, great day. Um, yeah, and one, I think that was probably probably the most important game I ever remember seeing, live or on television, because I knew by that stage I I knew Steve. Uh, very well, Parish and Steve Brower and, and Martin and, and, and um, Jeremy Hoskin uh, less well, but I knew the two Steves very, very well. So I was sort of with them, and um, I knew it's almost like you, your joy as a fan is gone when you know too much. That happened when I formed the Supporters Trust in 1999, 2000. Once you're aware of all the numbers and the figures and the realities of what r- running a football club is about. It becomes a very different experience watching a game. It's an emotional experience as well as it always has been, but it's not without strings attached. So I just knew what was at stake. I mean, I guess everybody knows that that game was worth about £130 million. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just knew exactly that it was going to be either the turning point in our history or not. And... I, I could foresee that that could change our destiny entirely, that one game. So my heart went into double rhythm. I actually did had an operation for atrial flutter about six months later because really? it would be triggered by things like that. And it took me 15 minutes after the game for it went back to normal. And, uh, you know, my, so it means my heart rate was up until about 160, which is not particularly good. Uh, and then... I actually sat alone with Maxi Jazz in the stadium. He was uh, smoking a joint uh, and uh, sitting alone and everyone had gone and inside was celebrating. And that, was, I didn't smoke a joint, trust me, I'm not, I'm, that's not my thing. But I sat just chatting with Maxi and finally my heart rate kind of went down and we just kind of basked in the glory of it and this empty stadium and, and how wonderful it was. Uh, but that was a, one extraordinary day. Yeah. Well, it, it links to John Jackson's post-traumatic syndrome. So, you, you know, your, your heart's still going. Okay. And also links to the Palace-Fulham game when you were the last person in the stadium. So this time it was just you and Maxi Jazz as he was having a spliff, which, you know, one of the ways to consume the playoff final. Um, I, I did hear a story that... Um, from actually someone who lives locally, because I'm, I'm not, I don't live too far from Wembley. I live in North West London, and he he told me a story that the players ended up in Holston High Street, which is literally uh, about five minutes from my house, with the trophy because Yannick Balassi came from here, and he said, "Oh, come on, guys, I know a good place to go," and they ended up in some bar in Holston with the playoffs trophy. Again, could be apocryphal, but I like the story, and I'm running with it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. The, the The party was in central London. It was it was near Charing Cross uh, stations. So there was some club there, uh, and then so they may have gone there afterwards. Uh, yeah. But... Well, that was probably the official party, but I'm sure the players, knowing the players, they'd have had afterwards. their own unofficial parties. Well. Yeah, yeah. No, there was there was it, it, it went late, late, late that 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 night. Yeah. Yeah. And. So you, I'm mean, impressive that you fly back for a game all the way back from the States. That wouldn't have been your first visit to Wembley. Uh, can you remember your first visit to Wembley? Was it for a Palace game? Was it for an England no, game? Do, I, do, you, do you get I, into following England the same as you do your club or is it a completely different 
I uh, no, I'm not. I'm not particularly nationalistic. Um, I do follow England, but not with much passion. Um, I, I think the first game I ever went to was a school trip to see Oxford against Cambridge uh, at Wembley. I think those are the sort of days of, of things like that. Um, the old Wembley. Uh, so yes, I, I've been to Wembley a few times. I've seen some England games there for sure. Um, but I don't know. I'm. I'm uh, I think I'm a bit more of a globalist. I, I, um, as I say, I do follow England and I generally watch their games. Uh, but I find friend watching an England friendly is almost like I, I could take it or leave it. Competitive games more interest, but um, yeah, I mean, there was a, start, a, a time when I was just as interested in watching the U.S. team because I found them more exciting. Um, probably 10, 15 years ago, I thought the US team was, was something really gutsy and fun about them. And uh, I thought the England team at that time was really sort of dull. So, but yeah, no, I'll watch England, but no, I, I, it's, club football for me is where it's at. Yeah. So you were in the States when they had the World Cup, I assume. Yeah, yeah, I went to one game. Went to uh, America, USA against Colombia um, when... Uh, What's his name? Scored the own goal. Um, Escobar. Escobar, and then uh, sadly paid for it with his life. Uh, so I was that at that game at the Rose Bowl. Yeah, right. And that must be. Um, it's not quite the Valley, but it's a pretty enormous stadium, isn't it? The Rose well, it, it is very similar. I mean, that and the Col LA Coliseum is the only other stadiums that remind me of what the old valley used to be uh, like. Um, and I've actually, I've actually played at the Col LA Coliseum um, in two oh. or three games. Um, and it's extraordinary. So it's, it's a, a hundred thousand and that's all seats. Um, I, maybe a bit less now they might've reduced that capacity. And the Rose Bowl is massive. It's, it's an enormous stadium yeah. um, in a beautiful setting. So, yeah, but that's the only world cup game I've ever been to. And I, to be honest with you, I've absolutely zero interest when people go, Oh, Let's go to, you know, wherever it is and watch the World Cup. No interest at all. No interest. I it's so well covered on television. The idea of paying through the nose for tickets and being around, you know, uh, a lot of kind of um, xenophobic kind of behaviour doesn't interest me. It, it was nice in the States because there isn't that same, uh, I guess it, it, there was less of that. Downtown Pasadena was kind of really fun during that 1994 World Cup. It was very, very um, uh, convivial atmosphere. It was really fun. It was a bit like going to watch spring training baseball in, in Arizona, where all supporters, fans from all teams get together and they have fun and they, they you know, drink together, eat together and whatever. And nobody cares because it's nothing. There's nothing really at stake. Um, yeah. So it, it's much more friendly, and, and but, but the idea of going to Russia to watch a World Cup or the Far East, I, I'm very interested in going to the Far East as a tourist, but not to watch football. Yeah, fair come on. But um, hopefully, when Palace get into Europe, you'll be going with. Uh, That's a little different. Like I said, club football is a little different, and I'm looking forward to the Euros. I'll be in the south of France all summer, and I love it there because they in the little villages that. Uh, we've got this place in a village down in France they put big TV screens up on the plane trees in the village squares so oh. you sit outside having your meal evening meal watching games it's fabulous and the, it's just a lovely way to watch Euros or, or uh, the World Cup yeah no that sounds great um, I'm off we're off as a family to South France but not that time we're going in August to Marseille actually which will be oh, yeah. Great. Uh, and I, I actually went to watch a game at the Stade Vélodrome the last time I was in France. That is quite a stadium as well. Um, yeah. It's changed yeah, that... a bit since, but um, very dramatic. Uh, and again, s slightly oddly reminiscent of the Valley because it has a huge uh, side. Uh, it's a stand now, but, you know, it used to be uh, just a standing, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So um, we, we've been on another fantastic journey um, from the Valley all the way to the Rose Bowl and taking it in between. Would you say there was one thing that stood out on that day in 1969 that 
you just thought, okay, hook it into my veins. I am ready. I'm I'm going to go now with this club and this sport in general. I think it was the, you know, the, that emotional thing that that men, we don't have too many areas where we can express our emotions or show our emotions. And football, I think, is a, is and sport in general is a is a great forum for men to be allowed to show their emotions uh, and hug strangers and just celebrate in a way that's uninhibited, particularly British men. We're so repressed. Um, so I think the excitement of almost scoring was so <laughs> addictive and you know, you say about three games or whatever, my first three games, but the fact that it was not until my third game that I saw Palo score, it's like delayed gratification. It's It was ex exquisite foreplay. I was teased to the point of ecstasy for so long that when it finally we scored, it was the biggest emotional orgasm I can remember. Uh, and being in the monks, the Homestale Road and you know, standing there when we scored the first goal against Portsmouth in that win. Um, so I'd sort of, it was almost like it kept me, it kept me more hooked because it was like, I, I, I it was, I, I've been kept in suspense. Yeah. And I guess my writing was informed by that too, because I, I learned how to lead people along and not, you know, you, you, you don't blow your word too early. <laughs> and, and who knows? Maybe my entire um, sexual life has been um, informed by that. That that it's good. <laughs> that it's all good to, to delay gratification, and um, and then when it happens, it's all the more sweet and all the more ecstatic. And so that sense. And and I remember in my university days, I went through a slow period where I got a bit depressed by life, and it was grim and. It was grey winter day and blah, blah, blah. And I went down to Palace and we were playing, I can't remember who we were playing, and I stood at the White Horse Lane and watching. I was kind of sort of a very grim game, but we came close to scoring and I suddenly felt my energy come back and my enthusiasm for life. And we scored late on, I think, with a goal from one of the worst players Palace have ever bought, a guy called Mick Hill from yeah. Ipswich who played a handful of games up front and was absolute rubbish. And he scored the winner near the end. And I remember just exploding and going, oh, I feel alive again. I feel alive again. I've got my mojo back. So I think that that's what football gave me. And that first experience teased me into that experience because it was not the same watching from afar uh, and reading about it. Uh, that's more academic so it became much more performative when I was able to go to a game and I've never lost that love and I still there's nothing that beats it you know um, and I can watch a game through I, I find it harder like on I'll be perfectly honest with you on Saturday when we played Liverpool um, because we've given away so many goals after the 75th minute I actually was going to uh, my my um, great nephew's first birthday party and I was going to be late. I actually went upstairs, turned the sound down and had a shower and got changed and ready. I couldn't watch the last 15, well, it would have been 22 minutes. And so I made sure I left just enough time and I came down and I came just a fraction too early. Let's talk about delay. It was a premature um, emergence. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and I saw Joachim Anderson like geeing everyone up and there was like uh, less than a minute left to go. And I went upstairs again quickly. And so yeah. I beat myself and came down right at the final whistle. I couldn't watch it. My heart won't take it. <laughs> and I, I talked to James Mitchell. Do you know James Mitchell? He's a Palace fan who I've known for years. And James, I, I, I make fun of him because if we go one up at home and there's, even if it's in the 20th minute, there's a very good chance he goes for a walk around Norwood Ponds because he can't really? watch. It's too much. He cares so much. And then he's thrilled if we win and he'll watch it later. But that's at a live game. I can't do that. I'll stay all the way through a live game to the bitter end. Yeah. But on television, I have I have to admit, I have at times gone 
this is too much that I we I, I'm going to go for a walk in the Hollywood Hills and I'll make sure I come back just around the end of the game and I'll be ecstatic or I'll be despondent. It doesn't matter, but I won't have to. My my heart and nervous system doesn't have to be put under that kind of stress. I've had, you know, for over four decades of uh, pushing my nervous system to the extreme as an actor and a writer and, and football's supposed to be pleasurable. So I, I can't put myself through that. Sometimes. I saw other times I will, I'll force myself. But I the, I hate the last 10 minutes of every game I watch now, Palace game. Well, as you say, we have a, certainly this season, we've had a preponderance of conceding goals, 75 oh. minutes plus. I mean, it's been... Worse than ever. It's almost 20 goals in that period. And we're, we're way above anyone else in the Premier oh, League, certainly. Not even close. Not even close. And we've thrown away 20-something points, 25 points yeah. from leading positions. So that that's difficult for me. Even you know, even yesterday, watching the under-21s win 4-2, until we got that fourth goal, I was like, this last 10 minutes is going to be uncomfortable for me. And generally watching the under-21s and 18s, which I watch almost, almost all their games, that are televised anyway, um, I find very relaxing. I love watching them because it's not the same stress and you know that the goal isn't really the result, it's the development. So yeah. it's less, and friendlies I love. I love going to friendlies, pre-season friendlies, because I don't care so much. Yeah. But, yeah. but league games and cup games, I don't mind them either. Okay, okay you're out, you're out of the cup. Um, it, it's the league games where I know how much it means. That's hard. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you have that insight because you've you've met the Steves and the people who took over the club when when we were so close to the brink anyway. Yeah. Um, but you have the consolation of when you get to the last fifteen minutes, you can walk around the Hollywood Hills, whereas your friend James has to walk around Norwood Pond, which I don't think is quite the same. Um, but yeah. fantastic! Thank thank you very much, Jim. I, I, I've absolutely. Love talking to you about this. Thank you um, clearly, Palace is a bond, but you know, I think for other fans, they will understand. And I, I think what you said about human emotion and you know us British people being a little bit guarded, I think that's a really good point. That you know we can release stuff that we wouldn't do normally. Um, I would love to see a copy of Shoot from when you were, uh, you know. <laughs> At that Middlesbrough game, and you were caught by the by the the photographer. That that would be a fantastic um, thing to take in. Um, so again, really appreciated your time. On it started with a kick, and and it certainly did start with a kick, if not a goal for you. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, really appreciated your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on.